Tanya J. Powers for Fox News Radio. Today I'm spending a few moments with the first ladies' man, Andrew Oak. I love I love the fact that you call yourself the first ladies' man. Because this is just the catchiest thing. People seem to get it. You know, from the very beginning of my journey researching these women, I had to tell people yeah. at each of the historical locations I visited to get to know these women that it's all about the ladies. I did not want to hear about their presidential husbands. Right. That's who we know about. That's who we've studied. Yeah. I was there for the ladies. And over this this year and, and, and plus journey, I became the first ladies man. And it just <laughs> it's stuck and, and people seem to really enjoy it. So I'm glad you do, too. You're an expert on the first ladies now because you've you've got a new book out it's volume two of this uh but explain let's let's kind of go back and talk sure, about volume course. one a little bit of explain course. how did it's a book about first ladies we know that how did you get involved in this uh, well i was i was the traveling producer for the c-span series first ladies influence and image so in at towards the end of 2012 i started out on this journey to document the lives of every first lady martha washington through now Melania Trump. The series went through Michelle Obama. It aired from 2013 to 2014, President's Day to President's Day. And it was C-SPAN's idea and C-SPAN's story, and I signed on as this producer. I got seven bags of gear, a plane ticket, and said, go, and come back with everything that's not nailed down. So I just got hours and hours and hours and hours of footage at all these different places. Every museum, library, church, school, train station, plantation, farm, every first lady pinballing across the United States to bring back to supplement the live show that was going on from, from D.C. with C-SPAN. And as I went along, I realized how much information I'd gathered, how much I'd learned myself, and how important these women are in the development of the modern world from number one, from Martha Washington, that after the series was over, I felt this great responsibility to to let people know all this stuff that I was so amazed that I had found out. Right, because I think a lot of people, you know, obviously there's a presidential library. Mm -hmm. That's easy. Sure. Uh, the, uh, the 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 guys up to this point, they've all been guys, so yep. they get all the attention. The first ladies are, you know, I think they're sometimes relegated to the well, they're picking out the china pattern and deciding which one, you know, what the what the Oval Office is going to look like and handling the dinners. And there's a way more to what they've contributed than that. That's right. Now they do do all that, of right. course. They are the hostesses, and they are one of the the main components of a president. PR machine. They make this man more acceptable, more palatable in certain instances, or support his good parts and, and try and... They are the partner of the president. They, they, they share a bed with the most influential, important, powerful man, arguably, in the world. That makes them the most powerful and influential, unelected and unpaid women in the world. Mm -hmm. And Martha Washington, if George Washington had not married Martha Washington, we would not be here in New York City doing what we're doing because America would not have happened if George Washington had married any other woman. That's how smart she was. That's how influential she was. That's how much she raised his social standings, how much she brought money to the table, power, uh, property, real estate. But not only did she bring all this this wealth and this status and this these advantages to the relationship, she knew how to manage them. So if she didn't know how to take care of this land and this finance and this money and, and, and life in general, Washington would have had to do it because that's what men did as women had babies and did the housework and did the, the the china and the dinners and the things like that but if martha didn't know how to run this for lack of a better term empire in, in the colonies at the time then george washington wouldn't cross the delaware or hopped on his horse or run up and down the east coast fighting the redcoats because he wouldn't have been able to that's how influential she is. There are a lot of a lot of women, a lot of first ladies who have who belong to this you know club, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, who have done a lot that we don't know about. What's the was there one most surprising thing you you learned in all of this about one of the first ladies that you were like, wow, she did a lot more than I realized. There was. There's a lot. I I, I break it down into into centuries because you can't pick, you know picking a favorite first lady for me is like picking a favorite kid <laughs> yeah. or a favorite pet. You know, what I mean, you just can't something you love that much, you just can't. But in the seven 1700s, uh, Abigail Adams is so 
massively influential and so in tune, she would be a progressive thinker today. Her thoughts on gender and race and religion are things we're still struggling with today. But long before women get the vote, she told her husband, remember the ladies. Everyone knows that quote, or most people know that quote. But what they don't know is in that letter surrounding those words, she says something to the effect of, remember the ladies, for when you have them in your favor, you will have the men on your side. She knew, and I compare it in modern times to like, in your home, your husband or significant other, you know, he might be holding the remote, but you're picking the shows. So <laughs> Abigail Adams knew that she couldn't vote, but if her husband comes home, let's say I walk home, you know, in 1790, whatever, and say, hey, honey, I'm, I'm voting for John Adams. And she says, I don't think that's a very good idea. I start to question myself. I think, well, maybe that's not a good idea. I walk into the home and say, hey, honey, I'm voting for John Adams. And she says, well, you're a smart man. He's the best candidate. I say, well, I am a smart man. My wife thinks I'm a smart man. This is fantastic. Abigail Adams knew before electricity, before she could vote, men are holding the remote, but women are picking the shows. That, I think that's a great story. Um, um, by contrast, I mean, as you mentioned, they're influential. That could go good. That could also backfire. Very much so. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the longest sitting first lady, as, as FDR is elected to an unprecedented four terms. He doesn't finish out the fourth term, but... Eleanor Roosevelt is first lady longer than any other first lady in history, and it probably will be that because I don't think we'll be extending presidential terms at, at, at any time soon. No, probably not. Uh, for, 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 I just, yeah, I stay out of politics. Congress is not going to do I, that. I, I, stay out of, I stay out of politics, <laughs> but from what I read, people are trying to limit politicians' terms, not extend them. So, so in, in all likelihood, Eleanor Roosevelt for, will forever be the longest sitting first lady. She was actually his legs. He was in a wheelchair, as everybody knows, but he sent her out. Out, and she would go and do that exploratory, that kind of recon work and, and bring that back and give him the hands on eyes, boots on the ground experience. But then what he would do is if something went bad, he would say, well, cut me a little slack. My wife was the one that gave me the information. I didn't see this with my own eyes. And it gave him almost like a scapegoat. But And we weren't as upset because we treat the women better than the men. But also, again, they're not elected and they're not paid. So you really can't blame them. She's just out there doing the best she can. You know, speaking as FDR would, like, look, she's doing the best she can. She's bringing me this information. The policy backfire, whatever. And he wouldn't have cause to do that often. But like, let's take Hillary Clinton, for example. When she, when, when her husband ran, he said, you're getting two for one. Now, before that, I know that President Reagan said he didn't make a decision without running it by Nancy, and people got really upset. So what's good for one is not always good for another, and what's bad for one is not always bad for another. But everything that Hillary did for, for every glass ceiling she broke, I mean, there are things that she did that we cannot take away from her. Fantastic things. There's no other first lady that's been a senator. There's no other first lady that's been secretary of state. There's no other woman that's been the major elected candidate for a major party for presidential election. But all that she did to get herself in to those positions, she made enough enemies and made enough mistakes that that's what kept her out of the White House, speaking very generally. So you flip that to someone who is as educated, as intelligent, and could have done the very same thing like Michelle Obama, who didn't. She planted a garden. She wanted kids to exercise. She's got herself set up for a fantastic career in anything she wants to do because she didn't get her hands dirty in politics. But Hillary gambled big, it, and it paid off to a certain extent. It just didn't get her in the White House. So yes, when they get involved like this, it, it can go very, very well, or or it can backfire to a certain extent. The first volume uh, goes between which which presidents? It's Martha Washington through Ida McKinley. Ends with the assassination of McKinley, and then his vice president. Theodore Roosevelt steps in with his wife Edith Roosevelt, who is the first first lady of the 20th century, a, a New York a New York native. As we sit here in New York, from out at <laughs> uh, uh, Oyster Bay is where their home was, Sagamore Hill. Yeah, and it goes through Melania through, through Trump. Melania Trump. Okay. I go right up to uh, you know I give my thoughts. M Melania hasn't had the time to do, and certainly even the Obamas don't have their museum to go and study and research. They've got eight years at, in the White House that we can look at, but to look at how they relate to other first ladies and compare and contrast them based on my research and travels with all the other first ladies, I can give you a pretty pretty educated uh, estimate of, of how she'll fare and what she maybe should do and where she should go and, and, and not go. Okay, I'm showing my, my history uh, dunce cap for just a second here. Was there, seems like there was a president that wasn't married. 
There was. You, no, that's not a dunce cap at all. Hey, that's fantastic. You got, it the you got a gold star, as a all matter right. of fact. Uh, James Buchanan is the only bachelor president not to marry. Mm-hmm. Uh, as the story goes, he was in love with a girl named Anne in his hometown of Mercersburg, Pennsylvania. They were engaged. She broke off the engagement. And before he could reconcile, she died, just like basically everyone in Buchanan's life. And then his niece, Harriet Lane, is his first lady by uh, the official White House hostess, who she would be called. Um, and she did amazing things. This is interesting that you bring it up with the Trumps and Melania and things. And people are upset that Ivanka's in the White House and, and maybe taking a lot of a part, taking a bigger role than they would want. But from number three, Jefferson did not have a first lady. His daughter was his hostess. Buchanan, Harriet Lane is why we have a very, very highly respected and productive children's ward of Johns Hopkins Hospital. Harriet Lane inspired that because she lost her two sons. I'm telling you, everyone in Buchanan and Harriet Lane's lives died. It is tragic. It is tragic. And it, it, it hampered and, 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 and basically encompassed uh, some administrations when this happened. Uh, somewhat the McKinley's, uh, uh, definitely the Pierce and definitely the Lincoln administrations and things like that. But some people took this and flipped it and made it a positive and went like Grace Coolidge or Harriet Lane. And Harriet Lane started that children's ward of Johns Hopkins Hospital. She's also the reason we have a National Gallery of Art. So these family members have been a part of these administrations forever. And like we discussed earlier, some for the good and some for the bad. But I think um, President Trump bringing Ivanka in is is a fantastic idea. I, I don't I don't think Melania was the first person standing in line saying, run for president, honey. I, I, I mean, you know, we, we can be honest about that. But the fact that she's doing it and she did what she said she was going to do, she protected her son, stayed in New York, then moved to Washington, D.C. like she did. And her detractors didn't really celebrate the fact that she lived up to her word and came down. And she's a fantastic role model on the international stage. She speaks multiple languages. And these presidential families do have often a lot to contribute. And I think that's the case with the Trumps as well. You mentioned she protected her son. She's a fierce protector of Barron. Very son. much so. I, I interviewed her on the campaign trail way before we got to November of last yeah. year. And uh, I asked her, you know, what it's like to, you know, to see people, you know, bashing your husband on the campaign trail. And, and how do you protect your son from that? And she said, you know, that's it, it's a it's a struggle. It's a thing. And I said, you're, you're also not on as many appearances. And this was earlier in the campaign, mm-hmm. and she wasn't on every yeah. every stage. Ivanka was there for a lot for right. a lot of sure, that, sure, 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 as you mentioned. And uh, and and she said no. She said I one of us needs to be home with with Baron. You know, she wasn't farming this out. No, this was something she was very very hundred uh, percent. Yeah, I'm so exactly. glad you brought that up because also the 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 historical relevance to this is uh, is is there. I mean, this is not unprecedented behavior. Raising children is hard to do in life. It's even harder to do in the White House or on a political campaign. And historically, women, first ladies, candidates' wives have been shielding their children from the press forever. Lucretia Garfield was Lucretia Garfield was Melania Trump before Melania Trump was Melania Trump. She, she they had one, one of the uh, in in Menor, Ohio, uh, one of the last successful uh, front front porch campaigns. What they would do is they would walk, literally walk out on their front porch, and tens of thousands of people would come to their hometowns to listen to their speeches. They didn't travel. They never left their house. Lucretia had just redone part of the lawn and part of the garden, and she had tens of thousands of people trampling her garden, trying to take souvenirs off the house, running through the house. This She made strict rules about where people were allowed, who was allowed in the house, who was not allowed in the house. And there, if you go to Menor and you go to Lawnfield, is their estate, you go to the top of the stairs and Garfield's office. It's beautiful, 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 with, with, with wonderful uh, um, verses from poems and stuff etched in the, over the, the fireplace and his desk and his library and he would walk down the front steps and Lucretia would be right there by the door and she'd have their children in the back of the house as far away from anyone. Didn't want them photographed, didn't want them seen, didn't want them talked to. She would open up the door Garfield would step out on the front porch to the masses and she'd close it right behind him. Not let anyone in except maybe like some top leaders of the party or some town officials but even then she had what was called standing refreshments and it was refreshments that were so limited 
and in, in portions that you wouldn't stay very long. She wanted those people in the house to get what was done and then out, get out, get out of my house, let the children get back to anything. Uh, Edith Roosevelt was very, very strict with the access to her children. The Clevelands moved out of the White House for part of the year because their young children were getting picked up in, in the White House lawn. By, that's who built the fence, the original, one of the original fences around the White House, because people were walking in and picking up their children and taking pictures with them or posing with them or trying to tear parts of their carriage off. Uh, we're, Americans are wild. We are crazy, crazy, hypocritical, short-term memory people that when we are in that mob mentality. And the White House just used to get trashed all the time. And people want a piece of these children just like they want a piece of their president, just like they want a piece of the House. And Women like Melania Trump have done a fantastic. The Obamas too, uh, uh, the, the 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 Bushes. Um, I, I'm I'm old enough to to remember uh, uh, Amy Carter going through her awkward stage in the White House. It's hard being a kid. It's even harder being the kid of a president and first lady. So, is this the subject of your next book? Presidential children. Mm-hmm. It, I, it, I've I've kicked, uh, I've kicked it around. No, There's uh, enough mm-hmm. of them. I tell you, you know, one one of the amazing things you talk about things that you discover and 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 on the on the trail as I was doing my journey and things. Clifton Truman Daniel is the Daniel's uh, uh, grandson who who cares after. He's a historian and author, a wonderful World War II scholar, um, uh, and and he cares after the the family legacy and the name. And he allowed me into his grandparents' home or or escorted me in a private tour because they don't let cameras in there. I was the first camera in over thirty years. In which home allowed into the. Uh, Truman Home in uh-huh. Independence, Missouri. Wow. I write all about it in the book. And it, was, it, was, it was so remarkable because he grew up in that house. Those were his grandchildren or his grandparents. He didn't know his grandfather was president until he was asked about it by a teacher in school. She said, well, you, you know your, pre- dad's, your grandfather's the president. He went home and told his mom something like, Mom, did you know that Grandpa was the, was the president of the United States? She's like, well, yes, we did know that. But they were trying to just have their children raised in a, in a normal atmosphere and look at them as Grandma and Grandpa, not, 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 not President and First Lady. But, um, uh, Clearly before the age of the iPhone. Yeah, well, yeah. Sure, and, and, and everything else. That we, yeah, nothing, yeah. Is, nothing is secret. But, but to, to find out what a remarkable woman Bess Truman was behind the scenes, she was more of a Melania Trump. Or Melania Trump is more of a best true in that she's she was her husband's confidant. She was a behind the scenes. She wasn't out there like Jacqueline Kennedy. And Jacqueline Kennedy was great for JFK. Each of these women have to find their own place and their own role and do their own thing. But in meeting these relatives of the the presidents and first ladies, it does make you think about these children and grandchildren that are still alive and protecting their their parents and grandparents' uh, legacies. And it, it's it's remarkable to think about a, a series on that or or a book on the, on those. It really does fall to them. I mean, it's, it's sort yeah. of the family business, whether they like it or not. You're born into it. Absolutely. And that's a lot of the things with these first ladies. I mean, some of them go charging full ahead. I, I think of, 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 of like uh, um, Helen Taft or, or Mary Lincoln or, or Hillary Clinton. I, I mean, they wanted to marry powerful men that would take them places and ride their coattails or, or, or push their own agendas and do whatever they've got, which is, which is fine. Great to make that political partnership. Uh, uh, then there are are the, the the more um, you know uh, uh, love matches and things? I think of like the the, the Coolidge's and and the Reagans for 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 sure. Uh, uh, one of the greatest love stories of of of, of the White House and the Trumans. I, I mean, Harry Truman saw Bess Wallace in a like a, a church kindergarten in Independence and like fell in love with her and 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 managed to to get a, an, an audience with her as a teenager and they started courting and never. Looked did anyone else the rest of their lives? I mean, it's for or never dated or you know. It, it, once they once they were there, that that was it. So um, you know, some of these women were, were thrust into the role. Uh, Best Truman did not like the public very much, and she didn't think Washington was the greatest place in the world or the White House was the greatest place. In the world. Did I mean loved her time there for for sure? But she wasn't out just leading the charge like uh, some of these first ladies are. Julia Grant uh, cried the entire train ride back to Galena because she kicked and screamed, didn't want to leave the White House. But Jane Pierce did nothing but cry while she was in the White House because she she disliked it so much. But that, that's a that's a very, very tragic story of, of loss as well. She lost all of her children, uh, including the, the last one, Benny, in a, in a tragic train accident. 
while they were going from uh, Andover, Massachusetts to um, Concord to pack up their house to move to the White House where she didn't want to go. And a train car derailed and their son was tragically killed right there in front of them and then and then the public kind of blasted her for being kind of grim and dire and uh, you know and there weren't support groups back then and there wasn't i there were no iphones and and there weren't uh uh, you know support groups and 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 medications for depression things i mean i you know I, i can't imagine the loss of losing a child let alone right in front of you and then only to do it publicly and then to get you know blasted for it in the media of wow. just being like sort of like a, a not a chipper person well you know who would be yeah exactly so the, these women's it, it's you know the series was called first lady's influence and image and they're all influential and they all have an image they have the dresses they have the china they have the jewelry and the, the pomp and circumstance but we have to remember in addition to the fact that they're unelected and, and unpaid and there's no you don't go to college and take first lady 101 i mean this is they are thrust into these roles sometimes eyes wide open sometimes not but they are human beings they are little girls they're young women their girlfriends their wives their mothers aunts cousins grandmothers widows I, they are real people that live love laugh lose and studying them and getting to know them as humans have them step off the oil paintings and out of the pages of history books was truly remarkable, and, and that's why I'm the first ladies' man. You do this very well. You you get you make these people literally seem just as alive as you possibly can, and uh, and I can't wait to actually read the book. You know, history's pretty cool again. It history's is. very cool now. So I, I, I figured that out. This is the time to have one of these books. I look forward to seeing what you're going to do next with it. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been wonderful. Absolutely. Come back and uh, and tell us about the presidential children book. That any, you may or may not be right. Any and every time. <laughs> uh, we've been spending a few moments with Andrew Oak, the first ladies' man. I'm Tanya J. Powers. This is Fox News Radio.